Right. So um, thanks again. I just wanted to welcome everyone um, to this final closing presentation for a project that has been ongoing. Well, the, the training has been ongoing for 12 weeks. It's really been in preparation for about two years. This project has been. So I'm really excited today for our final um, team presentations um, of this project. So this is an FAO project, um, which was implemented in the countries of St. Lucia and Dominica. And this training really was a, this project, I mean, was really a training. It was a training in how to use drone and geospatial technology within the ministries of agriculture of Dominica and St. Lucia, but really also with a um, lens of looking at mapping and monitoring and disaster risk management in terms of agriculture. So today we are very briefly this morning going to go over what the training, what the project was about, but the majority of this presentation is going to be from these two teams themselves. It was um, been going on, like I said, for 12 weeks, they've been in training. So rather than me tell you about what this project's about, really this is gonna be an interactive session where the two teams show you what they've learned, explained, and show you some of the data and information and projects that they're thinking of how this technology and this training exercise can be used. So um, this morning, I just wanted to start here with the agenda for this meeting. As I mentioned, it's Zoom. This is a recorded meeting and the replay will be available um, probably later today or tomorrow. So we will share that with all the participants that have joined in today. If you are joining in from somewhere else and you're not part of our core team, you might wanna put your email in the chat so that we've got um, your contact information if you want any follow-up on this project. So. Um, I just gave you my quick welcome, but I think we can start here. And I would like the country of Dominica, the representative to maybe um, give us a, a good morning welcome and introduction. So who in Dominica, I, I'm assuming it's probably Dr. Casimir, if you're here. Uh, I'm sorry about that, um, Dr. Kim. We were just um, getting our PS on, so she's oh, trying great. to log on now to do the opening. Oh, so we can maybe move with St. Lucia. And okay. then soon as she joins in, Dominica will give their welcome. Thanks for the update there. All right, so can we push this over to St. Lucia? Mr. Innocent, um, do you have your opening speaker, please? Well, good morning to all. Um, am I being heard? Just testing yes. the mic. Okay. My, my, the Honorable Alfred Prosper, uh, my Minister of Agriculture, we really wanted to be here. He actually um, he kept calling me. He said, on one meeting, he was hoping the meeting would finish early enough so he can join us, but it's not working out. So he asked me to just deliver the, um, the remarks on his behalf. Right. All right. So um, this is on behalf of our esteemed Honorable Alfred Prosper. And um, I'll read the, the, um, the speech he had prepared. He says, um, FAO officials, uh, Dr. Sandoval Roboto and Ms. Lisha Monroe's trainer, Dr. Kim Baldwin, officials and participants from Dominica and St. Lucia and other guests, good morning to you all. Historically, drones were originally developed through the 20th century for military missions that were considered too dangerous or inappropriate for humans or soldiers. However, by the 21st century, drones have become essential assets to most militaries. So we can safely say that drones were first used to fight wars, whether these wars were undercover or in plain sight. Today, however, I am very happy to see that drones are used to fight a different war. They are used or are being used to fight the war against hunger. They are being used to fight for more effective food production systems. This agricultural drone mapping training and its closing ceremony is a testimony that drones are now being used to fight for food security. With over 4,000 farmers in St. Lucia, it tells me that we need leveraging technology like drones 
and drone mapping to help us with data collection on crops and livestock enterprises. Further, when I consider over the last five years that 2,276.3 tons of dressed with chicken with a sales value of approximately $26.3 million EC were locally purchased from the poultry processors. I am happy and so very happy that we have professionals now trained in the use of drone mapping to help us obtain necessary data on our poultry farmers. Having said this, let me take the opportunity to give a warm welcome to our officials and participants from Dominica, St. Lucia and FAO, trainer Dr. Kim Baldwin, other officials and all other persons under the sound of my voice. I give a warm welcome to you all. Thank you for your attention on behalf of Honorable Alfred Prosper. I thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I think I'll put back to Dominica. Um, Adisa, have you able been able to reach the PS? I'm here. Oh, great. Dr. Paul, <laughs> welcome this morning. Thank you for joining us. Sure, no problem. Thank you as well. Um, pleasant good morning to everyone and my apologies for joining in um, a bit late. Um, we actually have an interesting activity coming up in a few few minutes where we will be launching the um, rehabilitation of the White Tikubuli National Trail. So that has some prospects for our staff who have just done this um, June training. So let me express welcome to everyone. Um, and of course, to thank Dr. Baldwin for her leadership for her zeal, for her enthusiasm in imparting the knowledge um, and the skills that she have to our, our staff. Um, we are very happy, and I must say on behalf of Minister Grant, who is very elated to, we have the budget coming up to make, um, to give visibility to this drone training and its impact and how we see it's going to um, assist the ministry in achieving some of its um, um, objective as it relates to agriculture planning, as it relates to monitoring and evaluation. Um, we have a $700 million target that the prime minister has set for um, increasing agriculture's contribution to the GDP. And to address that, we have to leverage and of course harness our technology skills. And this is where the inputs um, of our staff based on the training that they have received will assist the ministry um, uh -huh. in zoning um, into um, focus areas as we plan more specifically for some of our subsectors in the um, agriculture sector. Obviously, um, this training that they have received, um, one can imagine the di multidimensionality of that training. Um, recently, we had a child abduction case and our staff were called upon um, based on the training that they received to assist the police in, in um, mapping some of the areas where we believe the abductor had um, um, our young um, Dominican. And so the point that I'm bringing across is that the training, although it was envisaged to help the ministry um, in advancing its food security um, agenda, um, the training can be used across the board for a number of our development objectives um, and to help in terms of responding to our crisis. So we are very happy, of course, with the support of um, the FAO um, the UWI for investing, I see it as an investment in our staff, for allowing our staff to have that opportunity to build their skills. We have some staff who are very interested in drone technology, and I imagine that that training, they will upscale that training and take that um, knowledge and skills more much, much more further than we probably even anticipated. Um, of, of course, I see this training again as um, allowing the ministry to work much closer to some of our um, key stakeholders, um, for example, in the land use planning, physical planning division with the forestry um, division, with the central statistics um, office in terms of um, our listing, in terms of um, helping documenting and collecting information for um, our agriculture census. Um, also with our fisheries um, division, working much closer in terms of mapping um, some of the information that we ordinarily would not have collected. So um, on behalf of Minister Grant um, and Minister of State Rivier in the Ministry of Blue and Green Economy, um, I want to wish 
um, everyone a pleasant good morning and to welcome you to this discussion that we have. Um, and of course, again, to express my thanks to FAO and to the UWI, particularly Dr. Baldwin um, for her leadership and for her input. And again, congratulations to all of our staff who have remained committed um, to the process to ensure that they see it through. Thank you and pleasant morning to everybody. Thank you. Roberto, do you have anything to say this morning? Not to put you on the spot. Then. Nothing really. Just, just, just to say hi to, to everyone and thank our colleagues from, from the ministries for for, for raising the event. So yes, so I think we, we can proceed. Dr. Baggy, thank you. Okay, great. Um, we'll just keep moving along then. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And thank you, um, Mr. Innocent on behalf of Alfred, Honorable Alfred Prosper. So um, it's really been, as um, you, you heard, a really exciting training. It's been really hands-on and practical. So uh, as I mentioned, let me start my screen share again. We are going to give you an interactive presentation here and review what this project was all about. Um, sorry, it's saying on pause. Share. Resume. Okay, great. Can somebody confirm you can see my screen, please? Yes, we can, Kim. Okay, yes, great. Yes, we can. Great. So um, for anyone that's just joining in, my name is Dr. Kim Baldwin. I am the Director of Marine Spatial Information Solutions. I'm also a research associate and I've worked with the University of the West Indies at the CERMES Environmental Studies Department for over 20 years now. So um, this project really was looking at agricultural and drone mapping and monitoring for disaster risk management and also using geospatial, you know, so drone technology is great, but really the power of drone technology is the geospatial data that it actually can produce. It's more than a pretty picture. So that's what um, we're really gonna talk about today is how drones have allowed us, you know, in recent years, probably I started flying uh, commercial drones in 2015 and drones really in the last five to 10 years have allowed us to very easily and quickly collect data and map areas that were previously inaccessible and do so in a way that's safe and minimally evasive at the fraction of the time and cost of traditional surveys. It is really just a, a picture like this. There's a lot of information just from an aerial photo that we could get after, let's say, a disaster or before, or to understand, um, let's say, impacts even of sargassum or the number of boats. But really, as I mentioned, where the power of this software and this training and this data comes in is when you pair off the shelf commercial drones with spatial mapping and analysis software. This actually can allow for a real time, more comprehensive picture of the environment. And it allows us to do this so that we can support more informed decision-making um, in a variety, as Dr. Paul mentioned, of, of situations and scenarios. So um, just a quick overview. I mean, the trainees are really gonna show you how they've used drones for agriculture and disaster risk ma mapping and monitoring, but really drones and GIS in terms of agriculture are heavily, they're one of the largest um, mapping users, construction and agriculture, the two industries that are actually the, the highest uptake of this technology. And drones are commonly used now for agriculture, for, for land use planning, getting 3D information such as contours, understanding soil and field analysis using drones, as you've probably seen on the internet for, for crop spraying and pest control. Um, you can create information and 3D elevation models to better understand the irrigation that's needed or maybe flood models. Um, using special sensors to understand plant health, identify variability that's happening on the ground, as well as monitoring changes and measuring management effectiveness. I really think that this is a great tool to see and compare changes over time, before and after, to compare and evaluate certain trials or management approaches that have been put into place, and really um, helping to you know, make our decisions 
quicker, but also more effective and efficient with less resources. So drones are used also um, for agricultural disaster risk management. And in particular, in this class, we looked at the ways drones could be used for pre-response planning, disaster preparedness, hazard risk, and vulnerability assessments. We also discussed the applications for post-disaster planning, such as mapping impacts, damage assessments, planning mitigation, infrastructure rehabilitation, response efforts, as well as Dr. Paul mentioned, the, the pilots in Dominica actually got a firsthand experience because there was a need that they needed to go assist during the class. Um, also, we focused a lot on using drones for agriculture in terms of food security in terms of better, um, more climate smart, climate resi resilient planning, um, and not just in terms of food. I think it's also looking at the people, the livelihoods. How can we use this technology to help improve resilience to the people um, in terms of the face of the, clim the changing climatic conditions and disasters? So, um, I'm not a disaster risk management or planning specialist. I am a fisheries biologist and environmental manager by trade. But um, just a quick um, overview, disaster risk management really in order to, to manage and plan for disasters and be resilient, we need to understand the hazards and the spatial impacts of these, the exposure and the vulnerabilities. And so really, what is the goal of disaster risk planning and management? It's really to build resilience, build resilience both before and after the disasters hit us. And how do we do that? Well, in this class, what the approach I've taken and FAO has taken is we have conducted a training class that have showed and trained these teams in the two countries how to apply a participatory UAS GIS approach to create geospatial data so that it can help us, assist us make better, more informed decisions. So really this class was not just flying drones and mapping drones, a big portion of this class, and my students will probably tell you, uh, provided them with a lot of critical thinking um, skills, was really the thought process, which you know I've taught GIS for about 15 years now, of spatial analysis, the thought processes of planning um, from start to finish, setting up and developing a monitoring and um, strategy. So obviously we focused on agricultural disaster risk management, but this process I've taught them could be applied for a whole variety of environmental and management applications. So the lens we used, yes, was agriculture disaster risk, but I think it's really important to, to, to explain that the trainees have learned about everything here that's on the right. They've learned from start to finish how to plan, go out and conduct, create, collect data and, and, and analyze it. So it was really that process of how do you set up and plan for a monitoring strategy? And also how do you apply a participatory approach to implementing a geospatial information system within the countries. And so really GIS drones and monitoring strategies, you need to consider the five main principles of GIS. So that my trainees will tell you, I've been ringing this through them, right? You know, so we've really focused, uh, you know, if we wanna be effective and long-term implement these sorts of strategies, we need to think about next steps. We need to think about institutionalization now. And so what I've had the students do all throughout the training course is think about the people, the hardware, the software, you know, once they, you know, identify their analysis, how all these other components interact and mingle. So this class, really was this uh, practical approach that showed and trained the, the students in how to apply a participatory UAS, I call it, approach. Everything from the site assessment and developing the monitoring strategy to using and mapping the data, but, but also integrating how can we understand and integrating the existing data besides the drone. Because as I mentioned to the students, the drones can create spatial data, but it still needs people, right? We most often 
almost all the time with drone mapping and monitoring, you have to do some sort of field survey where it's a ground-based survey where you measure something on the ground to give the computer information so that it can actually um, help answer problems. Or maybe it's local knowledge, working with farmers information, talking to the communities about impacts and other social economic considerations. So we talked about how do we create this information? How do we integrate it? And how can we analyze it in order to create the types of information that we need to answer our problems or our issues that we started off with at the beginning of this process, but also how to export it, how to share it in a whole variety of ways. So the training objectives of this project overall were three main objectives. One, it was training the pilots because with the exception of maybe one or two people, nobody had ever flown a drone in this class. So it was start to finish how to fly safely and commercially. So a big part of the first component of this class was setting up and understanding commercial operations, setting up drone units within the Ministry of Agriculture of these two countries using a commercial standard operations manual. And we developed the internal policies and procedures within these countries along the way over the last 12 weeks. We also, a part of the project was to demonstrate, which I think we've done very well um, throughout this class, the applicability of agricultural drone mapping and monitoring and how it could be used for disaster management in the countries. And then the students over the last about three weeks, four weeks, have set up within these large scale monitoring sites we set up um, little sub case studies and have demonstrated the various ways this data, once it's collected, can be retooled and re leveraged in different ways for, um, you know, disaster risk management. So they will be sharing with you this whole process. Um, in conclusion, how was the training delivered? So we had COVID that popped up right in the middle of this fun project um, and grounded me and prevented travel for the first year or so. So we ended up having to deliver this class using a blended format, which was an online training academy. You can see on the right, I have built this entire course into online lessons resources, but it also was blended with weekly, twice weekly, um, full day Zoom sessions, and then course exercises and materials and flying as, as well. So as I mentioned, it was three main components over these three, 12 weeks. So basically the first month was them learning how to fly safely and commercially. Then we started learning about how to do drone mapping and monitoring strategies and more advanced drone mapping surveys in general for agriculture. The terrain of these two countries, in particular Dominica, is extremely high elevation um, and both of them. Forestry is a, a more difficult and flight planning environment. So we really learned how to fly and map in tropical forests. We learned also about how to analyze, process, and use this data and share it. So this were the three main components. We started with nine or eight to nine pilots that were trained that started the beginning of this training straight through. About midway through, we got an additional 10 data people in each country that joined the team to learn they might not be out there flying, but how to use the data, how to view it, how to analyze it, how to create information, and how to share it. So the second half of the class, we had a full about 40 people that have continued on through this class. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to, I hope they're ready, um, hand this over to the pilots. I can turn the slides pilots, but I would like to hear from Dominica, who in, of the pilots is going to present um, for your team right now. Dominica, please. Who's on here? It's a pilot. Okay, guys, we need you now, Davis. I can see you there. Yeah. So, is someone there ready to present? I can turn the slides for you. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the slides if you guys are ready. Oh, 
Violets, you're on. You guys, you ready? This is your slide here. <laughs> okay, good morning, all. Good morning. Okay, this is the uh, pilot. So we're just going to give a slight summary overview on our um, three month course on the drone training. Okay. Um, we started off with um, the introduction to the US, you know, on uh, band aerial system, where we learn the different technically different parts of it. Um, we got the drones, we went through um, simulation, flight control, flight simulator. We learned about the airspace and safety rules, and we also did, uh, like you said, the recreational trust exam. But all in all, um, it, all in all, um, we started very slow because it was a lot of information to take in, but gradually we, we grasped the information and it went on. Then we start looking at the DJL flight skills and protocols where we understand all the necessary documents needed in order to, to fly. Because um, just coming to a, in, into this drone training, we all thought that we would just take a drone and to fly. But we, we understood that there are so many things that need to be in place. For instance, before you can first fly a drone, there must be a, a flight request. So the person wanted us to fly the drone, the first thing they had to do is send a request, right? When the request is done, we have to go to the, the we have to go feasibility check to ensure that the flight, where the flight is, is going to take place, it is visible, it is safe to fly, fly and everything can be done appropriately. Following that visibility, we go to the mission plan, where we have to sit down together as a team and plan the mission, exactly what we want to, for instance, like we say, we're going to fly a mission, to map an area, we have to know um, how many hectares, um, the type of flights, the number of pictures, everything has to be in the, in the mission plan so that anybody picking up that document can understand what is going to be done and what are the information that we want to collect. Okay, following this, after the mission plan, we have to go and do a, we have a little document where we can do our daily checks of the, 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 the pre-flight check plans, the, right? We have the pre-flight checks, we have the in-flight, and then we have the checklist when we come back with the documents. Now, also there's a thing, we have the data sheet where we capture all the data, like the number of pictures, the type of the first picture, the, the battery life. So there are a lot of documentation that's needed when it comes to flying the drone. So in case of any emergency, any accident, any problems, anyone picking up that document, would clearly understand what was done, what was the mission, and what we went to do. Okay. Now, when conducting a, a, a flight survey, basically, there are a minimum of three persons needed for the flight. All right. So we have the pilot in command, we have the engineer, and we have the observer. All right, so the pilot in command does not interfere with any of the drone. So the engineer does the setup of the drone, everything. The pilot in command not, doesn't necessarily have to be the person flying. He could, he could request somebody else to fly, but however, if anything went, goes wrong on the mission, the pilot in command takes full responsibility. All right? Okay. Okay. Um, now, with regards to drone deployed, when it comes to flying a mission, we normally do our mapping through the software of drone deployed. Okay. Now, when doing that, you you go to your Google Earth, you get a piece of you you look for the area that you are looking for to map, and from the Google Earth, you could go into drone deployed, and then you look at the you could set your map to exactly what you want to be done. Okay, now, whenever you are using drone deployment, you have to ensure that you make it, you have a, a, a certain 
thing you have to make sure show a flight. So when you go to the site to fly, you know, if you don't have internet, the, the map is already uploaded, so you can fly your mission. Also, in June deployed, the, 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 the person doing the mission, their job is mainly to look at the screen. They don't look for the job, they just look at the screen to ensure that everything is on order. They have satellite, their payload, everything is working properly. The observer does only observing of the drone in the air and the engineering so that everything is well and taking care of the drone. Oh, with regard, yes, we did, we did approximately six flights in the syndicate area where we mapped over a thousand acres of land in the syndicate area. Um, six flights took us less than two hours to map a thousand acres. Like she said, we had over 775 images captured. We had two maps, we did videos and we did a panel. A panel. Like I said, well, as you can see, seven, seven hundred and seventy hectares is equivalent to 1,771.75 acres mapped in less than two hours of flight time at Syndicate. Now, with the map, we can capture a lot of different stuff. For example, your elevation, plant health, your counters, but however, that aspect of the training will be dealt with by solution. Okay, data management. Now, you could do your data both on site or you could wait until you come to your office, right? However, um, it's always better to do it on site. If you have the capability, you have the right instrument to do it. But if not, when you come to your office, you, 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 you take your memory card, you ensure that you have your, your um, portable drive and you store your images, your videos, everything. Now, every document has to be saved in a different folder, okay? So it has to be properly named and sequenced. It has to be properly sequenced. So anybody, anyone, after you as file command, upload your data, any of your data management staff can just go and capture all what they want to. Okay, this is an this is an example of the map or map of syndicate. A thousand seven hundred and seventy-seven acres, seventy-one acres, okay, and it just just the documentation is just a summary of the map details. Okay, when it, when the date the date flown, number of hectares, and so on. Great. That's about it, Kim. Yeah, great. Great. Thanks, Don. I know that you just had, um, just to let everyone know, he just did that on the fly. Um, great job for covering for your team there, Don. That was a really good summary of where, you know, all the way up to the process of creating the drone data. So thank you very much. Um, I guess we can just save questions for the end. Let's let all the teams present their slides and then we can discuss sort of if anybody had particular questions. Is there anything else um, the pilots wanted to add to that? Maybe if there's any comments you forgot, are you guys good? We're good for now. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Don and Dominica pilots. So now I'm just gonna do let allow a screen share. So Dominica just presented sort of the beginning part of the training and how to create and plan for drone surveys, how to process them and how to get results. So now we're gonna bring it back to St. Lucia um, before we go back to Dominica, but St. Lucia now, the team there, their pilot and data team are gonna show you a whole variety of case studies and applications they have created. So they're gonna present to you what the results look like um, and, and some ways they've used it. And then we're gonna go back to Dominica and show the way Dominica is now taking their drone data and applying it for national projects. So without any further ado, St. Lucia, please 
take over the screen. screen share, please. Yes, I, I believe it's enabled. Yes, all participants. So go for it. Oh, I think I have to stop, you right? Sure. I have to right. stop. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You think I would have learned this one by now, right? <laughs> Okay. Can you hear me now? Going, but yes. Yes, hello. Good morning. I'd like to extend a special welcome to everyone in this um, presentation. The St. Lucia Ministry of Agriculture drone team would like for you to please join us in a short, for a short introductory video depicting what the team has learned. Um, under the FAO funded drone training um, using the drone equipment and software tools. Can I know you? Is it all right? If for some reason yours has problems, let me know because I do have a copy of your presentation. Okay. Ooh, you might want to start it over. You're also in presentation view, Brennan. Brennan. Hmm. All right. Brennan, do you want me to just show it? I can probably see if I can get it up on mine, at least the video part, and then you guys take it from there. Okay, you got full screen now. See if you can restart and put on your volume. Great. We got it now. So this is a video that the team put together themselves just to let everybody know. Um, this is all footage that the St. Lucia drone team took at least um, over the course of the class. And they have compiled this to show that we can use drone data, not just for mapping and monitoring, but also the multimedia, the additional other alley, um, value added benefits. So, you know, by having video, as we know, it can be used for a whole multitude of reasons. I thought there was video um, music, but I guess not. So I'll let you guys continue then. Sorry. There was music. Yeah, sorry guys. That's what it's technical, right? Okay. Okay, we're continuing after that video. Um, we we did a number of case studies to showcase what how we could actually apply what we've learned out there in the field in practical applications. Um, we used the we, we generated a Maki estate base map of about about 718 acres. That was the total area of our base map. Um, we had a total flight time of 52 minutes in total and a open mosaic resolution of 3.3 .3 centimeters. 
elevation resolution of 13 centimeters per pixel and a total of nine flight plans conducted. We also con um, conducted five panoramic um, captures and two 3D models of um, artifacts in the Marquis estate. We're going to be continuing now to the separate case plans or case studies done by So this is their overall agricultural monitoring base site. This is the ortho mosaic. As Brennan mentioned, I believe it is more than 2000 hectares. I think I had the number is, or you guys can correct me here. Can you repeat that please Kim? Yes, great. I was gonna say how many, Mackie complete ended up being how many hectares or acres? I know the One last slide seven. seven something, but I thought it ended up being a bit more when you, you did the mouth, the river mouth part. It was slightly extended, but when we did the third area, for some reason, it didn't pop up on the map. So we were unable to find it on the report. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So from our over awful mosaic, this is the elevation. As you can see on the right hand side, you can actually see that the blue is below sea level and anything in the red is 53.5 meters above sea level. Mm. Then we have the plant health, which shows you um, areas that are dead or not alive. And also the green shows you living um, stuff. And then the annotations, which are the tools that were used to allow us to complete our case studies. And as seen on the map, there is a, a key on the right hand side, which shows you exactly what each annotation does. And it also shows you the coordinates and the elevations per annotation. Emmy? Yes, we can hear you, Stan. Okay. Um, this I'll be presenting for Winston Dublin. Um, his case study was a 3D model of an ancient artifact structure and a 21st century estate house. Uh, the purpose of the case study was for monitoring and inspecting of media, remedial works and site remodeling, and also to create a replica on a digital twin of an existing infrastructure. The benefits of his case study was for the education and awareness, historical structures and ancient artifacts with potential for agro-tourism development and also to generate revenue and support for nearby farmers. Also for disaster response planning and mitigation. Right, so this right there is a 3D model of a plantation house. And we also have another 3D model done by Winston Dubley of a um, sugar mill. This case study was done to plan and assess the farm roads in the area. The purpose of the case study was to evaluate the road infrastructure and conditions and to assess the repairs from Maki Bay up until Maki Bridge. The benefits are to improve road access and reduce the cost of repairs for farm vehicles and equipment by the farmers, and to also reduce crop losses through post harvest due to the conditions of the road. <clears throat> The tools used here were the issue tool, the line tool, and also the count. So here you can see the issue tool is popping up all over the map, showing the severely damaged areas. And it also gives the coordinates, making it easier for infrastructure to find the area using the GPS when coming to repair the road. In this 
slide, the count tool can, is visible and also the line tool. So the count tool can clearly show us that there are 31 portals in that area and the line shows the distance between it. The food security and planning for irrigation case study was executed by Mr. Joel Ramin and um, Shakim Odlam. The purpose of it was for planning and design of climate smart agriculture and to identify farms that need uh, a steady water supply. The benefits uh, is to aid the ICDF seven crop project and to evaluate the quantity of mainland pipes mainland pipes required for the Maki farmers and also to help in specifying the pump sizes required for each farmer. It also helps us to assess um, the number of farmers will uh, benefit from this intervention. Okay, this slide shows um, the tools that was used for the food security and irrigation case study, which is the line and area tool which is used to calculate the distance from the water source to the farm and the total size of the farm, which is critical, which are critical pieces of information that is needed to recommend pump sizes to farmers. This slide uh, depicts uh, elevation of a particular area on the map. Again, elevation um, is another critical piece, piece of information that is required when recommending um, pump size to farmers. The purpose of this case study was to identify vulnerability or hazard risk assessment. This is beneficial in preventing farm damages and reducing crop loss caused by periodic flooding. A line tool was used to measure the distance from the farm to the river. However, the elevation feature is extremely important as it displays the areas above and below sea level. In the elevation surface model seen, the areas in blue depict low-line areas and the red areas depict the highest points on the Maki map. Yeah, um, this case study was done by, by myself, Stanley O'Shaughnessy, and it's uh, Pasture Management and Forage Bank Development. The purpose of the case study was for planning and evaluation of efficient pasture management for increased access to high protein fiber grasses and shrubs for small ruminant consumption. Uh, the benefits is basically to improve uh, food security through improved livestock production. And also one of the benefits is increased animal growth and development through greater availability of nutrient rich forage crops. Uh, in this uh, case study, the annotations which were used were the area tool and the line tool. With the area tool, they marked the acreage needed for the uh, pasture bank, and also the line tool will give us an idea of the uh, distance uh, from the farm to the water source, which is important for, uh, um, for uh, the pump necessary to flood these pastures. Good morning. So this case study was conducted for immediate response and relief planning. The purpose was to identify sargassum abundance in the Maki River and also mangrove dieback. The benefits of this case study include the impact response, and this relates to the timely removal of sargassum to prevent damage resulting from river blockage and mangrove dieback, and also in planning and management to identify trends in sargassum buildup. In this slide, we can see three tools that were used, the area tool, the issue tool, and the location tool. 
So the area highlighted in blue shows the total mangrove in the Maki area, while the area highlighted in pink shows the dieback in that mangrove. And from the area feature, you could identify the dieback, the mangrove that has died based on its um, GPS coordinates. Also, we have the issue fish issue feature, and it shows the decomposing sargassum on the beach. Hey, I have a quick question about that last slide, if you don't mind. The mangrove dieback, did you guys use the plant health tool to help identify or, or pull out where the dead places were on the mangrove? Because I mean, your team hasn't shown that here, but I would think that that would have been one of the layers of information that you use to help can you, directly. Can you repeat, yes. please? Or? The question was, did you use to identify the pink areas, the dieback? Did you use the plant health, um, plant variability filter on the data to turn on that plant health? Did that help you identify the dieback areas? How did you identify the dieback? Yes, we did. We used that feature as well as ground truffin from um, the pictures that we got from the map. Okay, so you use both tools and great. Thank you. Hello, good morning again. Um, water resource management. This was done by Mr. Brennan Mafra and Mr. Terry Uthamon. Um, we did watershed management, identifying river water quality for food production. Um, benefits of this, Case study was for increased fresh water quality and availability for livestock and crop production by identifying artificial waste deposits, siltation, and algae buildup. Another benefit was the reduction of damage to the river's ecosystem due to these deposits. Um, the analysis is to be done by periodic assessments of the water quality, that is contaminant levels of chlorine, lead, mercury, and acidity, acidity and turbidity. Our map here is of the Maki River from the Maki Bay to the Maki Bridge. And the river is demarcated by using the area tool in drone deploy. And most of all of our, our work was done basically in drone deploy, the software that we primarily use. And it also um, uses the issue tool. So for, for ground truthing, when the water resource management agency, the, the agency that's responsible for water quality testing, does their ground truthing for silt and algae buildup. Land use mapping was this case study. As an extension officer, it is always vital information to be able to create, sorry, the PowerPoint is as person, sorry. Yes, as an extension officer, food security is very important and the ability to quickly identify Farm holdings is vital for research for other departments such as research and also marketing. So the benefits would be to improve the ministry's ability to plan and manage different farm holdings based on what is found on the map and to increase food security through vegetable production. So only one tool was used here, but also um, the location tool could have been used. Um, Every single color you see there is a different farmer and the area tool was able to set the perimeters of the farm and show the acreage whilst also labeling the farmer's name as you can see on the left hand side. This case study was done by Mr. Randolph Roseman and Greg Mitchell, um, identification of crop Pest and disease, purpose, improve for food security, monitoring crop health, benefits, planning and mitigation, improving, improve plant efforts and reduction in damage and crop loss resulting from pest and disease, impact response, improve in elevation and treatment of plant crops. Okay, so um, the plant health tool was used on um, Mr. DeCosta's farm and the area tool also was used to find out which areas have the most healthy crops, areas which have um, dead crops or crops that need treatment, right? Um, 
We also had an area where we were able to see how much land that the farmer has cleared up for replanting. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So this case study was done to basically assess the vulnerability and impact of the inclusion of TR4 would have at the Mackey estate. And the benefits of this case study was to basically create a management plan in case this disease actually occurred. All right, so as most of my colleagues presented earlier, most of them used drone deploy to create their maps, but mine was actually created in QGIS. So the benefit that drone deploy um, gives is that it, it gives us flexibility in that we do not, we're not only limited to the features of drone deploy, but you could also use other open source or even paid software like QGIS or other um, GIS software to do your analysis. Um, this map was done in addition to Kishima's map with the farmer information to identify which farmers would be impacted by TR4 and the various areas where you could see the, the black outline, these are the plots under Musa production, either banana or plantain. The other advantage of using the drones and mapping drone deploy QGIS is that it gives us a greater efficiency in terms of putting our analysis together. Output is much quicker and uh, there's a lower cost um, attached to generating maps of quality and storage of you know our photos and any information that may be pertinent to important decisions. In total, the MOA Dream Team have has mapped 1,763 hectares. We did Rangulans, which covered 127 hectares. We did Barra, which is located in January, 61.6 .6 hectares. We did the Southwest Community College Farm, 30 hectares. We did Volet, which is a grazing area that is currently being processed for the animals, which is 49 hectares. We did a panel and photo and video report for that area. We did the Rodney Bay Marina, which is 200 hectares, Pigeon Island, 10.6 hectares, the Denry Survey, 436 hectares, the Barra Larry Shoes and Lapel area, which is 753 hectares, the Rodney Bay Hub, 16.6 hectares, and Kazaba Bay, which is 102 hectares. And any questions? Great job, St. Lucia. Um, that was a very great presentation in the terms that it showed a whole variety of applications. So I would like to hold the questions questions to just after the next presentation. But leading into the next presentation, and I think Steffi was the person that brought this up and I think it's really great. So just to clarify for those people that maybe weren't part of this training class, what's happened? So we've used drones and we've used a software called Drone Deploy that there was a slide that the Dominica pilots get. It allows the um, pilots or the people using drones to fly, process, and analyze information. So it is a cloud-based software that is a three-in-one sort of software. It helps with the, the flying of the missions, but it actually allows you to process this data and create geospatial data. So it creates from the drone UAS data, GIS data. And then the other benefit of drone deploy is it is a cloud-based like dashboard type of software that you can actually do some automated analysis. So many of the project members you showed you and many of the people I'd say 90% of the people that have undertaken this training are not heavy GIS users. So what this software allowed us to do is in a very short period of time, train people that have very little GIS experience to create the geospatial data with drones, but actually analyze it. And so those annotations you saw the various people write and that Steffi had showcased as well, and Adisa is going to showcase in a moment for Dominica, it allows non-technical users to create GIS data and export out of the dashboard straight into 
either export a shapefile or other sort of data set, Excel, CSV, JSON, all types of data, but bring it straight into GIS, bring it straight into another software analysis platform that can be used to actually do further analysis. But the benefit here is that you can have a non-technical user be the pilot, let's say, and out collect the data. And then you can allow them to create some basic spatial data as well and share it in a format that's very easy to use. So I think that that is a huge take home point and why I'm a strong a proponent of using drone deploy software, even though you do have to pay for it, is that it allows um, us to actually take things to the next level without investing all that time in the training of GIS from scratch. Um, because extension officers, as Gish many others, will tell you they're field people, they are boots to the ground, they're not necessarily the data analyst. So um, that's all I need to say there do that. Let's see if I'm going to go back to a screen share. Adisa and team, are you ready here? Can I get a confirmation? Yes, Kim, I'm ready, but I'm, I'm going to. Are you going to take over on the slides? Yes, or give, me you, a, okay. give, me a, give me a share screen and I'll put up my presentation. Great. I will shut down mine and you can jump right in now. Great. So I'm just gonna quickly look. Uh, you see my screen? Yeah, you probably want to get it. Yeah, there you go into full. Right, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna start off at the Ministry of Agriculture, our so-called information data system, where we looked at field and extension staff using mobile devices and drone technology to capture field information from producers and feed it into a national system where reports could be generated and other shareholders could actually see that sort of information. So that's a basic sort of process flow as our onto our current information data system. No, we have trained extension staff in using the SCOBO toolbox platform, and they're using it on the field to capture data and information. So we've also um, started off the drone technology training as well, and um, mapping of farms. So these are some of the initiatives that we would love to continue. So how do we put everything together, utilizing COBO data, the drone and QGIS, which is our open software for GIS information that we use at the ministry. I'm just showing you there a quick map of Dominica and our different agriculture regions. But for this drone technology training, we're going to zoom into the West region, which is located on the Western side, up Northwest. And um, we're going to zoom in onto the syndicate area. But these are the farms that have, we have mapped using our Kobo toolbox um, platform. This, you don't really need to really dive into it. It's just a quick snapshot of an Excel spreadsheet with a series of data that has been collected in the West Agriculture region. On our Kobo questionnaire, we have over 400 questions that we ask to farmers not all applicable based on the type of farming that the farmer does, whether it's crop, livestock, multi-crop, single crop. Anyway, this is our drone imagery that was done by Dominican pilots, and it was integrated onto the QGIS. So here now we can see QGIS, drone technology imagery, plus field data collection activities. Actually, these are um farmer holdings and farm locations that have been geo-referenced and this there is just a map showing uh elevation of, of a mosaic map showing the elevation so you could use this technology and actually identify farms and their elevation levels now let us just zoom in because we have all this data sometimes it can look a little clustered so i just sort of zoom into a specific zone in the syndicate area where we looked at farmer 
Um, we looked at, 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 at plot 70, 71, and 152. So we can see this is the holding of Jean Milot Remius, his gender, his gender, his farming status, his nationality, whether he has any equipment, his farming enterprise, he's a crop farmer, and we know he's a multiple or mixed crop farming farmer. And, and plot number 71 right here, we could see who the farmer is and all his other data set that's collected on the field. And plot number 152, we could link it to Vanik Vashe, who is a crop farmer. And um, all these details, you could also look at it on this imagery. So now I'm just zooming in a little further as to what drone technology, drone imagery could actually assist with this whole field data collection. So as we said, this is plot number 70 on our drone map, and we know who the farmer is. What are the crops that has been recorded for this farmer? We know he has yams, dashing, and his planting dates when he actually established these, these plants. And then we have a total acreage of 0 0.74 acres. So with that there, how do we use drones to actually do a little verification of that acreage? So on our drone technology, what we've learned is that you could actually plot out this farmer holding and we get an area of about 0 0.3 hectares. And then when we do the conversion based on the plants established, we see that the 0 0.74 acres is approximately 0 0.3 hectares. So now from a data management perspective, we can now say that the crop acreage that has been established for this farmer has been verified correct. Now, when we collect data from farmers, what a lot of time farmers ask, but what like <laughs> they don't see the benefit in just sharing, sharing. So we at the ministry now, we see the need to actually bring back data and information to our farmers. And one way drone technology could assist in that is, for example, on, on the drone deploy software, there is this plant health that was looked at by our colleagues in St. Lucia, where you could actually have an idea of the, the plant health status. And now you could go back to the farmer and indicate to him certain areas on his farm that remedial action might be taken in terms of there might be some pest problem, there might be a disease affecting your crops, because with that infrared technology, it basically highlights areas, sorry about that, areas of your farm that need attention. Now, there are certain questions I still have on this plant health tool, but the point I want to drive home here is that in our lessons for the past 12 weeks, we learned that there are a lot of different complementary apps that can be used, such as Agrimo. And these tools, these apps now will give us more precision in terms of providing that advisory service to our farmers. Now, this year, a lot of times our so-called stakeholders and counterparts, they request, for example, a farmer profile. And right now, it's, this is just an example showing you of a farm, we can see his farmer status is inactive. We look at the data collected, he has greenhouse and shade houses, and they mentioned seven, and there we could zoom in and actually see that these houses have been abandoned. But within the farmer profile, you could capture a whole range of information and actually tie it back to the holding. So as we looked at earlier, the 3D views of different things that was, St. Lucia did a great, great job in presenting that, so I wouldn't ne necessarily go more in depth. But with the 3D view, it is possible to do um, measurements where you could get the height, the, 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 the length of the structure, and if there's anything in the, in the structure, you could do a stockpile report. So there are tremendous opportunities for drones. Now, within the agriculture sector, I mean, Agriculture, we know from Dominican St. Lucia, it's a sort of a backbone to our economy and a lot of other projects sort of 
intertwined or, 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 or are related to the agriculture sector. So I'm just br briefly going to look at some of the key projects and how we can use drone technology to actually complement the work that is done. One of our projects is the Emergency Agriculture Livelihood and Climate Resilience Project that was funded under the World Bank to provide um, how you call rehabilitation to farmers who suffered tremendous damage after Hurricane Maria. So under this project, they provided support to farmers. And as part of our um, mandate within the ministry is to provide that sort of um, verification of the farm holding. So after all these tools, cash support training has been provided to farmers. Some, a lot of people want a, a, a picture, they want to see actually what's on the field. And like we all know, they say a picture gives us a thousand words. So they are now from the drone technology, how we could link it back to the, is this project is that we can see the farmers holding, who are expanding, who have rehabilitated, and the, 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 the use of these tools within their farming um, enterprise. So this is one where we see drone technology supporting our PIU project. Also, FAO have always come on board in terms of assisting Dominica after these storms and hurricanes. And um, one we know is uh, the damage and loss assessment methodology where we have been trained. And after Tropical Storm Erica and Hurricane Maria, as you could imagine, there was severe damage done to the agriculture sector. And sometimes within these reports, drone imagery will definitely play a big part in assisting um, provide that information to our interna international um, agencies. Yeah, the Bureau of Standards as well, and our farm certification program. The first thing within our, our record book is that a farm map is required. And this farm certification is basically looking at what is it that the farmer have and how does he go about producing the crop for, to, to look at issues of food safety, food, you know, food security to, 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 to for a better way. So there now, when these farm maps are required for the farm certification program, we could go fly a drone over the farmer holding and we could actually give a, a nice map of the farmer holding. Dexer and market intelligence. I mean, just last week, Dexer put out a notice that they're sourcing yams and pumpkins. So here it is with drone technology, we can, uh, in presenting the information to Dexter with respect to who are these farmers, where they're located, we could also give them some drone imagery for them to actually see with their eyes what we're talking about. Because sometimes when you present information to people, they, 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 they want to see what you're talking about. And drone imagery is a perfect um, tool to assist in that. We have a, 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 a what you call two young individuals assisting with a mobile app for us to basically look at marketing of agriculture produce. So within these apps there, a picture, as we said, tells a thousand words and these drone imagery can definitely fit within these apps for marketing purposes. We have the FAO Digital Agriculture and Innovation Project. Um, our colleagues from FAO, again, is from around, um, Kiron, they've been providing support to the ministry in terms of looking at the enabling environment for the adoption of e-agriculture solutions at the national level and to establish a network of in-country innovation hubs to accelerate the development and uptake of digital innovation that support farmers and value chain actors, especially youth and women to become more competitive. So I, I, I would love to bring that question to my FAO colleagues. Then drone technology is definitely an innovation within the agriculture sector that could actually achieve some of these objectives under the Digital Agriculture and Innovation Project. We also have carried for us an agriculture census now the work plans and certain programs have already been so-called established, but 
I'm asking to my FAO colleagues again, is it too late to look at drone technology within the ag sector? I think it's an it's a, it's a opportunity for the Caribbean region to really bring up ag censuses to the 2021 so-called digital methodology of looking at, at farming. So can we incorporate some component of drone technology within our ag census to pioneer these initiatives? And I mean, a lot of other countries over time, I definitely believe that using drone in agri censuses should be a recommended step in, um, in, in moving the ag sector forward. Because I mean, yes, we question farmers, but at the end of the day, the farm holding is the unit that we evaluate in and drone imagery can definitely assist with ag censuses. Some of these projects that we've done in the past that I think, you know, in terms of sometimes having these projects, all these documents on the shelves and yes, you have a report produced. We can actually, you know, over time, we look some of these projects and see how drone technology could actually enhance the information that's provided. One such project I make mention of is with support with the UNDP and um, the Jeff, the Sustainable Land Management in the Commonwealth of Dominica. And this project is basically the, to look at um, land use planning for five parishes. Now, if the country have the resources, then we could do it for the other five parishes as well. But we did for the five, we know what are some of the products that are coming out from these things. And one of them is, uh, before I go to the thing, I just, I put in some of these maps on the presentation where we have a lot of GIS information, soils, rainfall, slopes, watershed. So with a drone imagery actually overlaid on these GIS maps, you can imagine the quality and quantity of information that we can produce. I mean, for our soils layer there, for the syndicate region, you have an idea of what the farmers are and um, you could make those recommendations, the rainfall quantities and, and, and really climate changes. I mean, one of the issues that have been affecting plague in the agri sector, especially during types of drought and, and heavy rainfall. So drone imagery can definitely enhance this sort of quality of information when it comes to climate change within the agri sector. So here now is on the sustainable land management project. These are some of the products that came out of the, the, um, the project. And it's basically a map showing where the so-called um, facilities or the land use in terms of health centers, roads, um, schools, active farms. Now that's a, 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 how you call it, a satellite imagery that was enhanced in, 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 in QGIS. Now imagine we have a drone imagery instead of these old, I wouldn't want to say antique uh, old maps, but in terms of enhancing and really bringing out the information Imagine we had a, a, a map, a drone map of this parish of St. David and all these things that we see within this map, we could actually see it from an aerial perspective. I think it would definitely add value to all these um, maps that were done under the project. The next project that we sort of recently completed, but I think we need to have that further dialogue with these partners under this project and see how we can now use drone technology to actually enhance some of this work. But it's the Cocoa Cluster project where 114 farms were sampled at two depths. And then we have the spatial distribution of all these farms that have been mapped. A soil fertility lab report was done. And um, there is a geo database now with all these information in there. Now, as part of the project, project precision mapping, where we can look at the physical and chemical properties of the soil and look at improving some of these um, strategies to assist the soil. There we can see that drone is a recommended tool used for that soil improvement strategy because when you fly, you could 
as we saw in our presentations in the past, you could really pick up a lot of information using these sort of imagery. So some of the products under the um, Cocoa Cluster project is that we have our soil, we have our soil information in terms of and, um, pH, organic matter, soil texture, soil fractions. And um, I didn't really get the time, but what I really wanted to do was to, 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 for example, let's look at soil texture there. We could actually zoom into this area, overlay the drone imagery on there, and we can now have our farmers. We can now relate that information to farmers in terms of the types of soil textures that they farm on, the organic matter content, the pH level, et cetera. So I think um, drone technology that definitely a lot of benefits to the ag sector. So just to sort of wrap up, I think some of our colleagues look at it, but some of the annotation reports that were done by our pilots there, we'll just quickly go over. This one is the location annotation report where we can see, for example, two, three, one, and these are abandoned greenhouse structures. We know the elevation and the geolocation. Number four there is a coffee demo plot that has been established and all the other so-called annotations that were put into the map. But we got an in-depth look at that with the St. Lucia, so we wouldn't really go in depth. There we did our distance and we looked at certain basically irrigation projects that could be examined. There's a waterfall and how we could actually um, ir bring water to farms for irrigation purposes to assist with climate change issues. And there we did our area. So we have a banana plot right there and it's 0 0.15 hectares on a surf, um, area of the land. We looked at uh, irrigation and development, uh, irrigation and drainage development area right there. And there it was the farm. I don't know I, if anyone in there was following me well and could actually indicate what 0.15 is. If we give you a slight clue, it's 0 0.3 hectares. It's um, John, the, 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 the farmer, where we looked at integrating drone and Kobo data. So I did an annotation report. I was able to do an area and I got the 0 0.3 hectares, which was equivalent to 0 0.74 acres for the farmer we looked at earlier, where we integrate drone QGIS Kobo field data collection into these maps. So I'll end for now. I mean, we could go on, but for the sake of the presentation, I, uh, I could end. So it, just some of my final thoughts is that if we are serious about using drone technology, it has to be something that has to be looked at in terms of resources, capacity, to ensure that sustainability of drone technology within the agri sector is something that is taken on board. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Adisa Trotter. That was a great presentation. Um, you really helped bring home and show how this drone training and geospatial training, how it can be integrated with national projects, as well as with existing geospatial data. You also touched on um, basically how drones provide us with um, a different scale and, and better resolution data than traditional satellite aerial images. Um, and the timeliness and the accurateness of, of this sort of information. It was a really good way to show um, start to finish. You know, I think that this presentation, we've learned about flying. We talked about learning how to do the mapping and monitoring. St. Lucia gave us an amazing overview of lots of different ways and tools that were used within Drone Deploy. And then yourself and Steffi showed, okay, we can have some users that are maybe not as data strong, but they can be using drone deploy and still participate and contribute to this geospatial data. And then we showed how it can be integrated, integrated using more advanced analysis. So there are, as Adisa touched on, a number of automated as well as 
um, advanced GIS analysis that could be done in terms of remote sensing, in terms of AI and machine learning, I specifically talked about Agrimo and various other um, agricultural specific apps that have been built. As I mentioned, this class was 12 weeks. It was the students and the trainees can tell you it was very intensive. We've learned a lot and they've actually learned to go out and do the skills as well. But there is a lot more to learn. As um, most people in this class can say, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think they've realized even though their skills and these teams, I have complete confidence. I'm very proud of both countries and where we've got started and where we've gotten from. So um, I'm going to do another screen share here and see back on our slides where we are at. Sorry, let me escape out. I shouldn't have jumped it so soon here. Um, so with that being said, I think we are going to let Roberto, Dr. Roberto Sandoval from FAO take over. But the way I wanted to end this was Really, as I mentioned, these teams, it wasn't just flying drones and mapping. We really worked hard and a large majority of this class was the um, planning and implementation and setting up um, commercial drone units within the Ministry of Agriculture's of the two countries. So understanding the different roles and responsibilities, the flight requests, the permissions, requesting access to data information, all those various organizational operational workflows have been drafted out and the two different teams, their two countries and the pilots, the way the organizations have set up these units are completely different in the two countries. So they have different structures, which would make sense because your organizational structure would be based on your own individual needs and applications. So we have um, a proposed structure that the two teams have put into place. And again, the pilots and the data people can tell you, we keep having to revise this. This is an adaptive management sort of process. We're just learning about drone technology and how they can be used within the countries. So no, these are drafts. So at the end of this project, one of the deliverables is an operations manual and policy for each country, which have been drafted. We have them today for sharing, but also it has the draft roles and responsibilities. And so the teams know that maybe in another month or two, as we go out and we actually implement and start doing a lot more things, these probably need to be refined as we learn sort of the workflows and what works and what doesn't. And then the last other thing that we can end with, and I think I'll let Roberto take over on these slides, is really the strengths and or the assisting and resisting factors in terms of cap capacity and next steps and where do we go. So the teams in both countries have sat down and they've done brainstorming sessions, which we will start a conversation by sharing with where the teams are at, and then we can open it up to more people. So um, Roberto, I don't know where you want to start, if you want to discuss anything about the operations manual or just go straight into the capacity. So I will let you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kim. I, I have a few slides. Yeah, great. So, we could allow yeah, me so to you want to, I'll stop sharing and you can go right into that. That would be amazing. Thanks. Go ahead. Yes. So let me just, I have 30 windows open. Sure. Okay, can you see the slide? Yes. Yes, thanks. And again, good good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, special greetings to, to our colleagues from, from, from the ministries of agriculture of Dominica and St. Lucia. Uh, thanks very much for, for finding the time. Uh, thanks also, uh, greetings also to, to my FAO colleagues. Uh, thanks for, for joining. Uh, so uh, I, I've been, you know, I've been smiling for for the past hour already, you know, to seeing all, all of the outputs and you know what what has, you know, been been done so far. To to an extent that I I was supposed to just work with two slides and I now have fifteen, but I'm I'm not gonna go through an entire lecture or, or something. But you know, it was just enough to to really inspire, you know, uh, thinking in terms of like the next steps in terms of how we we could take things to, to, a diff, to another level, you know, now that the foundations are, are indeed quite solid already. And, and this is what, what we essentially have been aiming for, you know, to, to lay the foundations for, for, for the teams to, to be able to, to know that the, what elements are, are the most important, you know, to, to be able to, to improvise and institutionalize the, 
the adoption of, of this technology. So, uh, yeah, so that's why I, I prepared a few more slides, but mostly visual, you know, very, very visual and very practical. And I just wanted to highlight, I think, five points that we can consider to, to facilitate institutionalization and then move, move towards the discussing, you know, the way forward or next steps, any other feedback or any other thing that you would like us to, to consider. And in terms of like helping, you know, address uh, a better, you know, uh, the, the remaining capacities that, that you would like to, to be enhanced. Okay. So first thing that I'm, I'm happy to, to note is that we, I think we did not have any drone crashes, right? Uh, Honestly, I mean, I've, I've been supporting drone work in, in, in Asia, in various countries in Asia since 2015. I mean, we, we, we've always had drone drone crashing, you know. So this is, this is an example of, yeah, I, I can't remember which country. I think this is in Burma. Uh, because we, in Burma, we, we used to, we, used, we, we had to, to build our own drones because you can't import DJI phantom, phantoms there. So you have to improvise, work with the university. And, and build your own drones and you know they, they, they do crash. So one thing that, that we've learned and I think that's that's important for sustainability of this initiative is, is to have contingencies and, and and to make sure that you know you know what, what to do when, when things happen. So this is a seven thousand uh, dollar ranger frame drone. So it's it's a fixed wing drone. It's it's much more difficult to, to fly than than your typical multi-rotor drone. So it crashed because of, of, of an unexpected, you know, stronger tailwind, stronger than normal stay of tailwind, despite, you know, monitoring uh, weather and coordinating with air traffic control. I mean, the air where this crash is, is, is a practice site for MiG-27s and MiG-28s of, of the Air Force. So we, we really had to abide with aerodrome safety protocols, but then we, we had this, this issue. And since we we were quite you know used to to having or experiencing crashes we we have contingencies for example so this is the the damaged airframe this is the what do you call this yeah this is the the new airframe so so we do go we do travel with a complete set of spare parts airframes and everything escs and everything and we we have a protocol such that when when you do crash the drone of course you abort the mission and then you should be mission ready already within 48 hours, meaning you have to, to recreate everything and reassemble everything, calibrate your autopilot and, and your instrumentation within 48 hours, if, if possible, including all the tests. So, I mean, just, 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 a, just, just a note, I mean, that I'm happy that we didn't have any drone crashes, I mean, during the training. Even if you have four drones each, no, <laughs> you have an allowance, but yeah, it's, it's just so nice. But again, a note for system decision, so, we, we need to, to make sure that we would have a part available later on in, in case something goes go, goes wrong or yeah to better it get get insurance for, for the drones and you know with this sort of things. So now on, on to the considerations for, for follow-up activities building on the very strong foundations developed during training. So I think it's I mean a lot of these things you have mentioned already. Uh, for example, uh, I think one one thing that we do we do need is to, to have technical and operational note, you know, or, or whatever document you would like to call it, documenting how drone mapping and PGIS can be integrated into, into ministry work streams, programs, and projects. So you did give the examples already. So I think it would be helpful if we do document it, you know, to, to show clearly what, what, what are the, how exactly this, this could be integrated or applied because it could help planning, it could help resource mobilization, you know, and, and ensuring that this could later on be formalized, you know, as, as part of the ministry work streams. And then another thing that we, we think that we would like to, to propose for consideration of, of the ministries of the countries is specialized trainings, our specialized trainings and missions on specific drone mapping applications. I mean, this ideally, this, this should be a continued investment, right? Uh, it's, it's, again, it's clear that the foundations are there already. I mean, some of these things you you've just you you just presented, you know, as, as part of the case studies. But and I but I do think that we, we there's still much room to to level up and 
you know, to to even upgrade the, the skills. So these trainings could include subsector analysis techniques, for example, uh, crop analysis, vegetation analysis. I've, I've seen good examples already of, of vegetation, vegetation analysis work using RGB-based filters. But there are still a lot of things that we could even can do, you know, using with, with the data. And now you have the foundation strong, so we, we could actually explore this, this additional tools or techniques. Uh, also related to what this said, you know, linking it to, for example, census work. Yes, the, that that could be a possibility. I mean, all it takes is is to to develop a, a methodology for for extrapolation, interpolation, and extrapolation of of representative data sets, and then that could, I think, help you know, uh, census work or you know, detailed uh, inventory work of of crops. You know, if you couldn't call it a census because of, of the lack of coverage, but at least, you know, getting getting or producing robust uh, crop crop inventories or vegetation inventories. I mean, that is certainly possible with, with drones, with what you've learned with, with the machine learning techniques and tools that are embedded within the softwares that, that you have or, or soon would, would have. Uh, also some, some fisheries uh, related training. I mean, coastal mapping and in this sort of things, uh, livestock and, and others. I mean, even, even forestry, uh, irrigation planning, engineering, you know, planning. And then we, we, we could also perhaps benefit from, you know, uh, a specific training on vulnerability and in risk assessment, you know, getting a bit more detailed, I mean, uh, conducting more detailed analysis when, when, when you combine slope slope profiles, you know, vegetation layers, uh, topographic features, so you link it to orographic features, and other information or data that, that are complementary to, to what you gathered with, with drones. So I think this is something that we, we, we could help you with. We, we have modules for this, and we can customize something very, I mean, for, for the Caribbean. Another thing, which I think is very important, uh, disaster impact assessment. So, so thanks for, for mentioning the, the FAO damage and loss technology. And we've had some experiences, a lot of experiences actually in this one, using drones uh, to support disaster impact assessments. And so I think we, it would be helpful to, to have a specific training, you know, focusing on disaster impact assessments, particularly how you use drones and you use satellite data as, as complementary data sets. And, and, and you know this already, you know how to use Google Earth layers already, you know, whether it's part of QGIS, whether it's it's a spark as part of drone deploy, and you know how to overlay drones. So this this disaster impact assessment would training would could could then focus more on extrapolation and interpolation techniques, you know, to to help you to produce disaster impact assessments that are reliable without having to actually map the whole country. Okay. And then others and then I think I, I do see that there could be value added in terms of like running a short training on ancillary data cleaning and, and processing, particularly for data that's gathered, you know, via Kobo toolbox or the complementary data sets. Because if if we are able to to enhance our capacities in this data cleaning and processing, and then you know, using some scripting, some basic scripting techniques, and then one could almost automate or semi, semi-automate or even fully automate the data cleaning process and even how you integrate it to, to, your, to your GIS platform. Mm -hmm. so, so this is something that, that might enable you know, uh, better products in, in the end. And then resource permitting, yeah, it's of course like part of a wish list. It, I think it would be nice to have additional software and storage now that again, we have the foundation set, you know, you know, you know, the use of QGS, you're not familiar with drone deploy. And now you have also, and these things have also made, made you realize the things that the other things that you need. Okay, so yeah, it would be nice to have like additional software storage, particularly cloud-based storage, maybe software as a service, uh, ArcJS online maybe to, 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 to complement the, the other software that you have. Again, it's, it's more, it's traditionally more sustainable to, to use open source software, but uh, 
paid software sometimes have a value added in terms of ease of use. And we are now becoming more cost effective in a way due to the subscription plans available. So we were hoping that, you know, through our work in FAO, we would be able to, you know, mobilize some resources to, to support some of these things. Uh, also sensor payloads like multi-spectral sensors. I mean, I, uh, if, if needed, I mean, five years ago, there's, there's, there was this notion that, you know, everyone has to have multi-spectral cameras or multi-spectral drones because that's, that's the only thing you can, that's the only way you could actually uh, reliably analyze vegetation, for example. But now we, we can see that for routine vegetation health analysis based, based on, on the vegetation profile, based on the vegetation type, you could actually use drone deploy already, basically using RGB-based filters to, to analyze vegetation type. But then, of course, if there is a need and there are resources, then it won't hurt to, to have at least maybe uh, one, one multi-spectral uh, sensor drone. And these are not as expensive anymore. I mean, as, as compared to like five or four years ago. Uh, and also, if, if needed, uh, geo-positioning uh, geo tools, you know, maybe a drone with an RTK and, and basin rover, if, if the, there is a need to, to have a near uh, survey grade uh, geo accuracy for, for, for mapping. But, but sometimes it's not needed because there are some, some tools or techniques that, that you could do to, to increase geo accuracy to, to a point that it would still be useful, not for, for, for geodetic mapping or, or something like that, but at least to, to reasonably uh, increase the, the, the X uh, the, the horizontal actors. Uh, and then, yeah, just, just, just a couple of slides. So, yeah, just maybe part of the wish list, you know, the, the advantage of having a multi-spectral sensor, a high resolution multi-spectral sensor, maybe an, a red and a, and a green or a blue plus a near infrared multi-spectral sensor, we could actually have, you know, higher resolution, it allow you to, to analyze things at, at a much higher resolution. And then imagine if you have this and then you combine it with the other RGB maps that you have, and then you could actually analyze things at pixel level, maybe define the pixel value and semi-automate the process in which these pixels are identified on the map by, by the software. So, I mean, the, these are the, the possibilities and which I think you can already carry out, you know, which was just a bit more, more training because I've, I've seen the foundations already. I mean, I've seen the the first set of examples already and and i think it's 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 really maybe it would actually end up you know the, this way at, at some point and then yeah as i was mentioning you know more and more advanced topographical analysis topographic mapping I've, I've seen good examples already uh this one is is more advanced in the sense that we we, we produce this using uh together with with an rtk and a genesis system so we're able to, to map at ATM with, with five meter contours, which, which is quite good with, with sufficient level of reliability that, that agriculture engineers are actually able to use it, you know, uh, without having to, to, to implement an extensive uh, ground truthing uh, mission. Okay, um, and you know, related to, to what I mentioned, I think you also have now the, the foundations to, to to integrate drone data with, with additional or with complementary satellite data sets. So again, some, some examples that you might have seen earlier. So you have on the right side, you have the drone data, you have drone, drone imagery, and then red, you have Sentinel-1A, which is a type of satellite data, which can be integrated also using Google Earth, using QJS, and even as part of drone deploy as, as a layer. And now that, that you've learned the, the, the foundations and then it's, it's just about, you know, learning how to, how to get this red layer from, from, the, from the main source and integrate it into, into, into your mapping. So I think this is another way to, to, to go, you know, uh, move, move, moving forward. On the left side is just the, the, the map without the drones and all of these different colors are represented, I mean, represent different satellite layers. But the nice thing also with, with drones, as you've said, is that, I mean, you could actually eliminate the need for, for, 
three or four vegetation layers in uh, satellite based layers because i mean the the drone the drone map can already contain a lot of this information at, at a much more higher resolution and much more you know higher temporality so but again just just to show i mean things that we could we could do moving forward and of course to make this not a static map but a dynamic and online map and then yes another example is integrating drone data into agro ecosystems analysis and livelihoods profiling we've seen the farmers registry data incorporated into into drone maps we've seen some of you produce you know vegetation other uh, uh, vegetation layers topographic layers so all of these we can we can put together maybe through through training through one of the trainings that i mentioned and you know and and help everyone you know produce a, a an updated you know a hybrid agroecosystems analysis or, or, or profiling so just just an example and then yes for for fisheries there's certainly a lot of room for for producing community-based hazard and resource maps not not just for fisheries but even for for upland communities so again this is an example where you have drones i'm showing this again because maybe now you would have a greater appreciation now that you've undergone the training and you could actually produce this already so yeah so where you have all of these annotations all of these symbologies i mean with uh, integrated onto the drone map and over uh, Google Earth layer. Okay. And I added this one last minute because I saw the example from St. Fisha uh, regarding this, this archaeological artifact that, that they map. And of course, maybe not really applicable in, in the Caribbean, but, but, but just to show that, you know, it, the drone, drone, drones can, can indeed uh, help, you know, analyze uh the dynamics and you know resilience needs particularly in areas where spatial patterns influence cultural and religious practices i think we mapped this this is over like maybe five thousand hectares uh this this these structures are are buddhist pagodas okay and what we did was to to map this one and these are obviously agriculture areas and what we did was to 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 map and analyze and together with the community gather data in terms of like how do this you know the positioning of these religious structures influence their their farming practices how 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 do these things influence their irrigation schedules how do they how do these things influence their their cropping calendars and their other practices that could actually harm the environment so yeah, so just another example of the multi-dimensional, you know, application of, of, of drone technology. And then related to, to building capacity, so supporting, you know, capacities for, for accessing, you know, complementary data sets, because it's, it's not just about drones, right? As we've been saying, drones are, are just one of the tools together with uh, community-based information, together with statistical information, together with, with large-scale uh, remote sensing information. So we have also been working with uh, other colleagues in Cermes, uh Dr. David Yosson, who's like the counterpart of Dr. Baldwin, but he, he deals more with, with the satellite data stuff. And so we, we are in the process of finalizing, you know, a technical guide. We're calling it Satellite Remote Sensing for Disaster Risk Management in Agriculture in the Caribbean. We, we thought that this is going to be a useful initiative since this focus is really on identifying the satellite data sets that are useful in the Caribbean context, because we do know that the availability of data, satellite data across Caribbean countries and across uh, landlocked countries are, 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 are different. You know? So this, this could cut, you know, reduce the, the workload, the JS workload, you know, by, by a big percentage simply by providing a ready an inventory of the data different data sets that one can use for which particular island group and for which particular hazard and which particular purpose. And we, we, we do have uh, draft uh, trainings already out, outlined. So, you know, addressing, you know, the different needs from, from beginner to intermediate and to, to advanced. And we hope that, you know, maybe later this year or early next year, we would be able to start 
rolling out some of these some of these trainings, you know, to to complement this this drone and participatory GIS work that that we have been uh, doing. So, last three points for the considerations. Yes, I think it's important to to address our remaining remaining constraints where where possible, including working around them in the case of resource limitations. It's it's nice to 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 have access to the best set of data, best set of tools and software, but but we know that you know resources are limited. And but one thing that's nice with these kinds of technologies is that there there are always workarounds with 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 these things. And then fourth, uh, formalizing the 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 integration of, of item one. I think it's it's important in addition to the trainings, uh, it's it's important that we formalize this, so, so that's why, so that there, there's that we that there's sufficient uh, political support, uh, there's sufficient you know institutional support to to actually enable the continuation of the work. Okay, and then others. I mean, this this is also meant to to trigger a discussion. So please let us know. I mean, uh, what what other things you would like to to be considered? What other things are 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 essential? Okay. Uh, and then, yes, Dr. Baldwin has already commented on this one. And then strengths and weaknesses. I'll go through this quickly and also with Dominica, and then we can have an open discussion. Uh, so strengths, uh, all participants are trained in EOS, pilots and data analysts for working drone kits and iPads, well-rounded and educated members of the ML drone team, gender balance, uh, age balance, uh, weakness, no cloud storage, no funds for remotely sharing data access. Yes, no hardware, laptops, desktops for the processing of the US, uh, USGIS data. Currently do not have the enterprise account. Uh, need to implement a work plan for the drone the spatial unit in US team members. I think this this also alludes to to to, to point number one. Uh, maybe need better payload, more specific drones. Of course, I mean who who would not want to have a more advanced drone, right? A more advanced drone, right? So or better better payload you know so that's 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 always the the, the dream of, of any drone team and of course yes insurance you know risk transfer or liability coverage needed and hopefully uh, available so that's for santisha for dominica yes uh there, there there's there's a good i mean startup set of gears trained extension officers with Plenty local terrain, uh, knowledge of local terrain as well as farmers, trained and capable pilots who understand the fundamentals of planning and flying mapping missions, availability of multiple data sets, farmer bio data, production data, weather data, risk maps, contour maps, yes, software, drone deploy one year, QJS, Cobo Collect, RJS Earth, Google Earth. And Roberto, business. just to let you know, yes. we discuss it in this class. We we learned a bit and we experimented using with ArcGIS Earth. Mm -hmm. is a little more powerful than I don't know how much you know about it than Google Earth because it does allow you to yeah. um, visualize and show shape files, JSON files, um, you know, straight without having to convert. So we we have actually, as part of this training, none of us talked about it, um, did use ArcGIS Earth sort of as that stepping stone to the Arc online and and for the people that are non GIS users, as I mentioned, most of them um, did not have a strong GIS background. So just wanted to touch on that point. Yes. I realized we discussed that and that was a, a good week of the training. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kim. I mean, it's 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 good that you touched also our GIS. Or, I mean, we were hoping that, you know, we would have resources to, to actually you know, get a subscription to, to our GIS. I mean, at least online, you know, for a, a few a few enterprise licenses, you know, to you know because it's, it's simply it's it's just more integrated, you know. Mm -hmm. So if not, we we use open source. So, yeah. You know, cost of additional training and software licenses, yes. Uh, no hardware for the processing of data. No cloud storage. Remote data access. Need to implement a work plan. Need additional field survey and safety equipment. U.S. insurance and liability. Yes, data sets outdated, different formats for software integration and compatibility issues, data conversion, QA. Yeah, I mean, I think some of these things I have already noted as, as part of the considerations. And I mean, all of these weaknesses, I mean, are, 
you know, these this are common in, in, in a lot of countries, in most countries, including those that I've supported previously, because, you know, sometimes you have to start small because you have to, 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 to show the proof of, not only the proof of concept, but the proof of application. Yeah. And then once, what, what, what we have seen is that once the, the management, you know, of the ministry has seen that, okay, yeah, the, these things can, can really, you know, help transform how, how the ministry works, the, the effectiveness of the ministry, how it delivers, you know, services. And then we, we have seen that it's, it's been, you know, slowly easier and easier for drone teams to actually request, you know, software or, or hardware because there, there are outputs. I mean, there are, you can some show something concrete already. And basically you just tell, the management so okay if we get this hardware then we can do this 10 times faster you know something like that or or, or, or software so yeah so thanks for all of these i think that the last part is just planning and next steps questions comments feedbacks if you have like a wish list of trainings that that you would like and then let, let us know please uh yeah operations manuals team roles you know and then I turn and then I hand over back to, to Dr. Baldwin. So any comments or suggestions, uh, colleagues? Yeah. I thanks would, again to our drone teams. Yeah, thanks. I would like the, the, the two teams to really speak up here now. But I think just bringing home one point of both teams, um, if I can speak for the two countries and the trainees, because we've really been talking a lot of this last week about implementation next steps. Um, there's two things that I've seen resonate in both countries, and it's number one, the understanding of the data conversion and sort of the data analysis um, strengthening that ne needs to happen. I think this training has showed both countries the potential, but it's now it's like, okay, so how do we integrate? How do we um, merge and really develop a solid, I think where I'm leading to is the second point is developing and institutionalizing a work plan. There's these great teams, people have been trained, but now how does that fit into their day-to-day -day roles? Where are they going to fit in the ministry? How are the teams actually you know, going to balance these new responsibilities and align them with national priorities. And I think both countries have come to the decision that they know that they need internal ministerial planning meetings to happen very soon, to sort of figure out. So we've taken, again, the foundations and we've started the discussions in both countries about what's needed. Um, but I'd like to open this up now to the participants of both countries to maybe comment and, um, you know, give some feedback on this. So thanks again, um, everybody for your time and patience. And I really enjoyed putting on this training, working with all the people in these two countries. It's been a rough, um, intensive, but very rewarding, I would say six months for me, but three months for them. Um, teams? Hello. Any, anyone? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Rubus. How are you doing? I'm fine, sir. Thank you. How are right. you? Kimo, just saying, you know, thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldwin. You've been such a wonderful trainer and given, given so much of yourself. Really appreciate it. And the trainees are so happy with what you've done so far. I just want to personally thank you again, you know, you know, for your wonderful work. Your, your, your passion for what you're doing, your strictness where it counts, your meticulous nature where it counts. Thank you so much. I, we really appreciate it on our end at the Ministry of Agriculture Management. Thank you so much again. All right, God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Innocent. Yes, and, and anyone else? Um, good morning. Hello. Good morning, Macaulay. We can hear you. Yeah, so um just oh, wanted yeah. to say, yeah, just wanted to say thanks again, Kim, um, for all that you have done for us for your 
patience with us, teaching us, because for some of us, this whole new um, world of GIS, it has been something very new to us in our field of work. Um, but we really appreciate the time that you took to teach us how to incorporate the use of drones into our field work. And it has kind of just, or I could say, wet our palate for the taste of the US systems. So um, it would be really good if we could perhaps see you again for some more training because we really appreciated the hands-on training that we received for the um, boot camp in terms of the drone. And I think for most of us, the in-person training really, um, the practical sessions really drove home the, the, the points. And I think it would be great if we could perhaps maybe have some additional training in the whole GIS and data management in person so that it would really um, help strengthen that component because I think as to the flying and the planning and the process, we really get that part. But if we could receive um, some, I don't know, further training on the GIS part and maybe some um, additional gears as well, because you know we had a lot of problem with um, the laptops and some of the other additional hardware needed, the tools needed and equipment. But overall, I'd like to say very much for the packages. Thanks to you, thanks to FAO for putting this together, getting us the drones and the um, gear that we have so far. And we look forward to going out in the field and putting it to use and making you guys proud, making the country proud. So thank you very much. Yeah. And, and thank both the teams. Um, I really can't say um, to all of you, I know how much hard work this was. I think. I think I was always saying it, but I don't think anybody really quite understood the intensity of this course. Um, I think both pilot teams have come back to me now and said, wow, if we had really realized how intense this was, how much effort this would be, maybe we would have reorganized things different. So I think that that is another really, I just have to give credit to all the pilots in particular who've stuck through the last 12 weeks. We've been full-time all day on Tuesdays and Thursdays, plus a week of intense boot camp. Plus they have their regular jobs and then they're out flying on the other days, reading webinars, materials, prepping exercises, doing, I mean, I've had them going like their full-time UE students for 12 weeks and they have all stuck through it. I know probably a little begrudgingly, but I'm happy they've made it because like I said, this is like learning a new language. You got to roll up your sleeves and both countries came full force and really have blown me away with their dedication and effort as well as juggling the rest of their personal and professional lives. So thanks again. Dr. Robuta, if I could just say one more thing quickly, please. Yes, sir, please. Well, you know, they say that um, first loves last quite a long time. So I have to go back to the, the first love that happened. That is Dr. Roboto. I also need to thank you because it was at the um, disaster preparedness training you have with the staff that you brought the idea of the drones and look what it has turned out to be. So I have to go back and thank you for that input, that, that valid contribution that led to all of this. And thank you so much for your due diligence and your commitment to this cause. Also, Ms. Alicia Monroes, who has been on our side working with us. I thank her also. And I thank the FAO as an organization, as an elite organization with great ethics. And, you know, I thank them also for sponsoring this and providing resources for this. So again, let me say a big thank you to you all. The FAO, Dr. Roboto, Alicia Monroes, Dr. Kim Baldwin, and FAO as an organization, thank you so much for this great contribution. We appreciate it. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, Mr. Innocent. And again, I mean, this won't be possible without, without the support of the ministry. You know, I mean, we can, we can do this training, you know, for, for six months, but, you know, without the commitment of, of the ministry, you know, uh, this won't, won't really be, be accepted be a success so thank you i hope you you are okay with our you know proposed next steps i mean we are ready to to support work planning and mapping of how to really integrate this into the different work streams of the ministry uh let us know and then we i can get in touch with you and and we can discuss how to to move forward with it uh, over Any any other
comments or, or inputs, colleagues. I, I know that Jay is training in data management. Yeah, face to face. I mean, that's 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 really how we're supposed to do things. I mean, I'm hoping that if if we do get resources, you know, to to fund the next set of trainings, uh, we'd actually be able to to do it face to face. And I'd love to to be on a you know boot camp at some point, maybe early next year or in the coming months, you know, to actually for further specialized trainings, right? Uh, disaster in practice assessment is quite quite interesting as as a boot camp for 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 drone mapping because it's 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 full of cool simulations and and, and everything and you have to do uh, mission planning on the fly you know and you're given certain parameters to 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 consider you know wind strength or something like that so yeah that's it's going to be fun in case you you'd, you'd be up for it so any other uh, inputs colleagues. Yep. Uh, Thomas Nelson. Yes. Hi, good day, good day, everyone. Hey there. Uh, I let me off my camera a little bit, but I just wanted people to see who Thomas Nelson is. Um, so let me put it all so I could talk. Um, thank you very much. And Thomas Nelson, the Deputy Chief Fisheries Officer, the Department of Fisheries in St. Lucia. Um, great to see you, Kim. Um, I've, I've, I, I do have one of uh, my colleagues. Um, as part of the training, um, one of our fisheries biologists, Ms. Um, Akiba Felix, uh, let me echo the sentiments of um, our Director of Agricultural Services, uh, Mr. Barry Innocent, to express sincere thanks um, to FAO and all the organizers and instructors um, for this exercise. I have received feedback um, from my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Felix, in terms of the intensity of, of the training, but also the value of the training. Of course, um, we're looking forward to the application of the um, uh, materials and the skill sets that have been um, derived from this training, or that, that I would say that have been earned from this training exercise to uh, more areas in fisheries. I, I know that there is some application or there will be some application in terms of coastal um, resources such as mangroves, but we're looking forward to um, extend this application to other aspects of, of fisheries management. Um, so just to say thank you very much and uh, uh, to FAO and the organizers once again, and we're looking forward to future collaboration. And I'm sure maybe um, Kim, knowing you that you know, your line will remain open um, for, for some time uh, so that the colleagues or the trainees can reach out to you um, if they have any further um, questions while they apply the training. Thank you very much once again. Thanks, um, Thomas, so much for that. I just want to end with a comment uh, uh, in terms of the continuing and the, you know, reinforcement of skills. So as another project that I'm working on is the SARGADAPT. It's developed, I've developed a drone mapping and monitoring protocol for sargassum monitoring. Now that training is starting on July 25th. And I do want to say I'm really excited that both countries, there are members of the geospatial analysts and the pilots of both countries that have signed up. So they will have continuation in terms of me mentoring and guiding the teams now again. So we will be setting up sargassum monitoring sites um, starting at the end of July and working together for another month period, going through the similar type of process that we just did in this exercise. So this is a great way to reinforce and expand the skills of all the trainees. So the two countries are have drones and they ha they know me. It will be again hosted using the online training academy. It's a virtual four week training. So yes, Thomas, absolutely. I'm really excited that both countries have signed up and teams, maybe not the whole team have signed up, but bits of the team have signed up. So this will allow for continuation and reinforcement of the skills that have just been learned. So that's, that's really, again, exciting for me is that I don't feel like it's the end of the road with me and these teams. I feel like we're gonna keep going through the end of the summer, at least, um, in terms of the training. So thanks again.
Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Awesome. Uh, any anybody else? So, um, what else? Anything else? Colleagues from Dominica. Jim, you're 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 oh, muted. I said maybe it's you're, one. You're <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah. So, and anything else, uh, or we we can call it a day. Nope. So uh, I think in just in conclusion, um, what we have to submit and present today in both countries is we've got the draft operations manual. Um, we do have the. Uh, data that was presented in these, um, as well as we will be producing a final training report with some of those key next steps and um, recommendations for implementation and institutionalization. So I have been working with the teams and you saw a slide brainstorming some of those ideas. So we will be producing and sharing that report as well in the coming weeks. Um, Great. Roberto, and Roberto. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Um, Ricky Brumant. Um, I just want to thank you and um, FAO and um, of course Kim, on behalf of all of us at the, at the at the division and ministry, for for such great effort. And I know, I just want to be short, but I I, I know that the team, um, as they continue, will work. And of course, the support of Kim and yourself, and um, Ryan. We will certainly use um, what we've learned and of course the, 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 the equipment um, to further our agriculture based on our own um, um, policy um, direction and policy pronouncement by government. We'll continue of course to use um, all this information and um, hardware and paraphernalia to, to further our agriculture and to bring um, results to our farmers um, as we continue to, 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 to progress. Thanks a lot for your effort. Thanks a lot for your support. And we will we, we welcome further, further action. And of course, thanks to Central Chef for teaming with us on that. And um, hats stuff to all our pilots, all our navigators, all our um, 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 participants. And of course, God bless. Thank you so much, Mr. Superman. So we will certainly be in touch with, with the next you know, support that we can offer. Thank you. Uh, anything else, uh, colleagues? Kishma? Yes. Hello? Yes, please. Yes, just a vote of thanks. <laughs> we would like to um, thank Kim for everything she has done for all the long time, all this hard working and keeping us under pressure and making us actually complete this course. I would not say in a timely manner, but for the right time, you know, um, I want to thank FAO. Um, thank you, um, Roberto. Um, thanks our Director, Mr. Innocent, um, especially the June Dream Team, we made it possible to the end of this training and we're looking to work with Kim much longer and do different projects with her and thanks everyone who have been part of that course. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much. Yes, and also of course, special thanks also to, to our uh, FEO national correspondents, you know, Mr. Raya Dancer, you know, Ms. Christian Monroe, and also uh, FEO police are in this call, uh, Dr. Iris Monroe and uh, Ms. Vermara Nextable. So, I mean, we'll be working with them increasingly with, with, with drones, and you know, so it's like diversifying the applications, you know, mainstreaming it to, 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 to the other work streams of, of the ministry, you know, including fisheries and value chain so thanks for for being a part of, of this event uh nothing more anything else before we close and thanks kim again i mean it's i'm i'm a teacher myself i used to be a teacher 
university so i i know how how you know it's 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 fun but it's not really that that easy you know to to manage a hybrid course especially a hybrid course you know i say this you're was... muted oh yeah am i muted no I said, yes, yes, no, no, I can hear. This was great. Yeah, this was a good yeah. challenge. Thanks again, everybody, for me, because this was the first time I've taught drones and GIS virtually. So it was yeah, yeah the virtual part part is not, and I want to thank all of the for bearing with me to learning how to use at the beginning. I'd never even use this online training software, this whole academy that I've built. So, you know, it was we were all learning along the way. So no, thanks again. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. So thanks everyone. Looking forward to doing more things in the in the field, you know, and actually getting concrete work done. So nothing more Then we, we say goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks, guys. And I will be getting um, those of you your certificates. So many of my pilots have gotten certified and done drone training with me, but also went ahead and went above and beyond and got certified for drone deploy. So we will get all the certificates organized. Um, I will, they had taken written practical exams as well. So I'll finish grading everything and getting the certificates to everybody within the coming week. So thanks. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a nice day. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Feel free to reach out if anybody else needs anything else from me. And I'll be back in touch with the trainees soon. I have I won't leave you guys yet. Bye, all take care. Okay. Bye -bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Kim. Everyone. Yeah. Bye. Woo! I could hear the party starting.